Hello, I'm Tim Sandal and I'm going to be talking to you about contamination control strategies, environmental monitoring and the application of rapid microbiological methods over the course of the next um, half an hour. OK, so let's get into the uh, nitty gritty. Um, so contamination control strategy is the latest buzzword or term uh, reverberating around the industry. And a contamination control strategy is a system that considers all the integral elements of a pharmaceutical product manufacturing operation. And it's something that best achieved through the application of quality risk management principles and supporting assessments designed at pinpointing areas of contamination risk and developing the appropriate controls and monitoring around these and in this session we're going to have a brief look at the structure of the contamination control strategy touch on microbial contamination have a look at environmental monitoring have a look at the application of a rapid microbiological method in the environmental monitoring space and then look a little bit about rapid methods in general before um, we uh, wrap up the proceeding. So let's um, consider what we mean by a contamination control strategy to start with. Um, well, there are some key uh, principles. Some of these are borne out in the latest draft of EU GMP Annex 1. And here, contamination control strategy is something that considers process, equipment and facilities. Um, and all of the totality of manufacturing and laboratory activities. And it's indicating that these should be managed in accordance with quality risk management principles. And these are tools to provide a proactive means for identifying, scientifically evaluating and controlling potential risks to quality. Risk assessments conducted should be used also to uh, justify any alternative approaches taken to those covered by the annex and supporting pharmacopoeia in the broad context, but only if those alternative approaches meet or surpass the intent of the annex. So when we look at environmental monitoring, we can consider how an alternative or rapid microbiological method can be supplanted by a more conventional method. The contamination control strategy is also important from the contamination control perspective. And it's important here that we're following carefully established and validated methods for manufacture and control. And our strategy should be implemented across the facility and to allow us also to assess the effectiveness and the control and monitoring measures employed. And such an assessment should also lead to appropriate corrective and preventative actions and for these to be taken as necessary. Such an approach should also not only be all embracing, but it should also be something that is a living, breathing document. It's always ongoing, always subject to periodic review. And the strategy should always be updated as appropriate as things develop or with following change controls and the like. And many people say, well, what exactly is a contamination control strategy? What are its key um, elements? And to a degree, this is always going to vary a little bit between um, facilities. But there's an operative word, which is holistic, which means that what's happening in controlled but not classified areas can influence grade D areas. They can influence grade C areas. That can influence grade B. The aseptic core and also grade A or from C to A if um, isolated technology is being used. 
So the strategy could be a single document or it could be a series of interconnected documents. And these are developed to reflect a site-wide strategy for identifying gaps and minimizing contamination control. So areas to be included are shown on the slide. So we've got things like design of the plant and the process, utilities, material control, vendor approval, control of outsourced activities such as sterilization, process validation, preventative maintenance, cleaning and disinfection. And with all of that, there's a focus on contamination and cross-contamination. And to develop such a document requires a good technical understanding of procedures and controls underpinned by good scientific knowledge. And there are some other elements as well. So we need to give consideration to such things as how many people are going to be allowed in a clean room any one time because they're going to be the key influencers of particulate control. Risk evaluation and mitigation strategies for the transfer of materials into the grade B or into the grade A area. The, uh, transfer disinfection is one of the fundamental um, weaknesses in many facilities. Isolator disinfection. An expansion of contamination, not just for the microbial, but also for things like pyrogen and particulate contamination and potentially chemical. If uh, there is freeze drying, then control of the lawfulization process to develop a meaningful environmental monitoring, uh, including things like sample quantities, methods, frequency to ensure that the environmental monitoring program is risk based. To help guide the identification of organisms detected in different areas as well. So although we may well do grade A and B isolate everything to species level as the annex is indicating, but a risk based strategy can help develop the C and D uh, microbiota profiling strategy. We can also use the strategy to help us inform about monitoring and managing the microbial quality of starting materials and the overall um, way that we get goods and materials um, through different areas of different clean rooms through the contamination control cascade. And as to when to establish a strategy, well for existing facilities, um, given that the latest draft of Annex 1 was issued in December 2020, then ideally something now already exists. It may be a work in progress, but the work has ideally started. For new facilities, then it's best to start as early as possible, try and bring in the contamination control aspects as part of the design process. And again, to re-emphasise, to ensure that uh, a document is continuously updated. So you're drawing on things like change controls, deviations and other forms of feedback. And also any uh, changes to technology or new products introduced into a facility, for example. In terms of um, some of the uh, other elements, and, and I keep going back to this theme of everything being... Uh, connected together. Um, you need to also feed in the contamination control strategy to a manufacturing control strategy. So there may be nuances based on product type, demand, process and risk. A quality control strategy, so we have some understanding of critical quality attributes for example. And to agree environmental monitoring should be connecting with that. And also cross-contamination if we're using very, very different products with different active ingredients in, in the same facility, then uh, the containment product segregation aspects will also be of importance. Now I mentioned about the holistic um, basis. Um, so we do need to have this interconnectedness and the understanding that um, 
process flows, use of airlocks, use of changing rooms, how we move equipment around the facility, each one of these is really important. And there should be this kind of overarching governing approach that can assess to see if what might be seemingly isolated contamination events need to be reviewed holistically. And again, this is also something that helps when we're formulating corrective and preventative actions, because one of the key expectations is to always ask what else might have been affected, um, how one thing may well, one individual issue might actually be bigger than it was first realised. And to construct an effective strategy, you need to have detailed process knowledge. And this is the whole process of developing, documenting, and maintaining process knowledge in order to capture that and understand hazards and risks. So valuable elements include understanding the design of the plant and the process. Uh, and the more we can draw upon uh, the development, the quality by design, then the better the understanding it has and the easier we can control contamination because we would have done some of that advanced thinking up front. It's also useful to consider um, what type of equipment is used, what's it used for, how does it work, how is it repaired, when is it contaminated, what are the um, uh, best um, control measures to have around that piece of equipment. And in terms of what we're trying to achieve, then it's very much focused on uh, contamination moving through the um, facility. So we're going to be having a, a reduction of bio burden, be that um, airborne or surface microorganisms, the, the microbial uh, uh, isolates from, from product, from intermediate manufacturing, and also clean room controls in terms of pressure differentials and air flows and uh, how, again, to emphasise how materials and people get into the facility. They're all um, really important um, factors there. But no matter how well we design facilities and, and have um, appropriate controls around clean rooms, such as HEPA filtered air, pressure differentials, uh, effective cleanup rates, appropriate airflow to keep uh, microbial carrying particles in suspension, then we will still get a degree of contamination and um, a lot of that contamination is going to be coming from people. Survey after survey indicates that people are the greatest contributors to contamination within the pharmaceutical environment. And what's on the slide are just some figures that um, I, I just put together from different uh, literature reviews. Um, so from uh, industry surveys, people are contributing around 70% of the contamination. This is obviously in a fairly generic, idealised facility. Uh, water, depending if there is water source in the area, um, is around 10%. And water is um, both a vector for contamination and a growth source. Uh, there's also going to be air, which is another vector. So microorganisms don't uh, grow in air, but they're easily uh, transported in air currents. Or if they're on uh, larger particles, then there's going to be the gravitational settling effect. And then we have a degree of surface items. This could be uh, naturally contaminated surfaces or the act of transferring items in and out of the clean room. And that figure can be much higher if we have weak controls around the whole transfer disinfection um, process. And we can conceptualise those hazards in uh, different ways. And here's one example. Uh, here we're discussing it in terms of primary and secondary um, sources. And here it's important that um, these hazards should be evaluated by a microbiologist in terms of the relative risk to the product and where we have then attempted to minimize controls through the environmental monitoring program and that program should be orientated towards the points of greatest risk so this is where uh, risk tools like hazard analysis critical control points kick in and they're particularly 
useful uh, in terms of this HACCP methodology. So a good environmental monitoring sampling program should be designed in relation to types of contamination sources and to consider each type of contamination source and again focusing on, on, on where people are congregating and where the risk to product um, is greatest. Okay, so it's kind of fairly broad contamination control introductory stuff. Let's go to environmental um, monitoring. Um, so monitoring in the environment is one of the key monitoring systems in the pharmaceutical um, process. So there's going to be things like physical monitoring systems such as pressure, airflow, temperature and humidity. Uh, checks to see whether clean rooms and utilities are functioning as designed. Uh, and these are all really important because they're quite key control factors in terms of the likelihood and distribution of microorganisms. But what we might well conceive as the core environmental monitoring program is something that's going to be based around a combination of viable and non-viable monitoring. For an aseptic facility that would be supported by media process simulations. Um, and this all requires uh, uh, also a, a thorough understanding of people flow and equipment flows and product flows. Um, and we need to help to use this for um, designing processes to reduce contamination, determining where the optimal monitoring locations are, and also to help us set appropriate alert and action levels to construct meaningful trending systems, and also in the types of kappa that we put together to address microbial data deviations. So with um, monitoring we should um, obviously make sure that our process is optimised and those contamination sources are minimised. And then where we have a continuing level of risk, even if that is the risk reduced to its lowest possible level or one more potential class as a residual risk then we can consider the appropriate locations of monitoring, things that are going to signal to us something meaningful, such as um, risk to product, increased risk from people, um, poor cleaning and disinfection, for examples. So we need to pick locations and have viable and non-viable monitoring locations. And as well as process understanding, then sometimes air distribution patterns, airflow visualizations can also be quite um, useful. Because of that multitude of different contamination sources, we want to use a combination of um, <coughs> methods. So for viable, uh, if we're going to go down the conventional method route, then that would be swabs, contact plates, saddle plates and active air samplers. But of course, with them, we've got this increasing raft of rapid microbiological methods that we touch upon. And then a risk-based environmental monitoring strategy would also look at frequencies and incubation um, strategies. So, just to reiterate, environmental control comes first. Control is more important than monitoring, but we need to monitor where we have control weaknesses, and that should be a risk-based program. But we should understand that any environmental monitoring is limited in terms of the recovery, in terms of the limitations of methods, in terms of the small sample sizes taken, um, due to the presence of organisms that are either naturally unculturable or are in a physiologically stressed state that they cannot be readily recovered at that point in time. Anyway, the key thing about environmental monitoring is the importance of trending. Often single results um, don't mean too much. It's the overall pattern, the picture of those results coming together that um, matters. And just to illustrate the process standing process flow point, then there's some uh, simple diagrams there, which is about um, looking at um, people flow, equipment flows, waste flows, and understanding the times these happen, the number of people involved, um, the types of things transported. This can also help construct a more meaningful environmental monitoring um, program. And we also need to factor in the 
media fields if we're doing aseptic manufacturing and there, there's choices there to be made about uh, the design of those in terms of the time containers interventions personnel and so on and also then um, what we can achieve with the relatively limited sterility test but we can at least strengthen that to a degree with a more developed um, sampling plan and putting everything together in terms of environmental monitoring then we might end up with a table like this which is about a biocontamination risk profile table um, where we expect to see reductions in bio burn as we move through the process we expect to see um, different uh, microbial profiles we may have different incubation uh, sorry identification strategies as well okay so that's environmental monitoring Let's have a now have a look at rapid methods and then how rapid methods can uh, help environmental monitoring. Okay, so uh, rapid microbiological methods have been spoken about for many years, and what do we mean by a rapid microbiological method? Well, it's something that aims to be more sensitive, accurate, precise, and reproducible. And this is in comparison with the rapid method and the conventional growth-based method. Because they are modern, then these are often automated and they will ordinarily capture data electronically or digitally for further analysis. And we can look at um, this um, quotation here, which is a few years old now, but it comes from the FDA guidance for industry for the validation of growth based rapid microbiological methods. And some key words there are different technologies, so we have growth based, viability based, cellular markers, automated, and providing something that is better, that is something having increased sensitivity. And generally, rapid methods can be divided up into these kind of core groups. So we have qualitative tests for presence or absence. So this could be a um, a rapid microbiological method to give us instant detection of whether we've got uh, coliforms in a given sample of water or E. coli specifically. And we have quantitative tests for enumeration, so how many bacteria are in a product sample, for example. Quantitative tests for potency, so this could be uh, classic endotoxin testing or some of the more um, uh, newer ELISA based endotoxin detection methods that are coming out or it could be an identification test so what is the species of bacteria found in that sample and how um, quickly and accurately can uh, a result for that be given. Furthermore um, we have um, growth based methods so these measure the biochemical or physiological parameters in relation to the growth of microorganisms and they're relying upon microorganisms growing in order to get that faster but more accurate detection. Then there are viability based methods and they use viability stains and things like laser excitation for the detection and quantification of microorganisms without the need for cellular growth. So something like flow cytometry would fit into that category. Then there are cellular component based methods and these look at the detection analysis of specific portions of the microbial cell and that includes uh, might include things like looking for ATP or proteins or surface macro molecules. I also have um, optical spectroscopy methods so these utilize things like light scattering and other optical techniques to detect enumerate and possibly identify microorganisms and we're going to have a look at one of those in a second. The nucleic acid amplification technologies such as PCR DNA amplification, RNA based reverse transcriptase amplification, gene sequencing and so on. And then there are microelectrical mechanical systems such as microarrays micro and biosensors. There's also sometimes talk of alternative methods. So alternative method doesn't have to be a, a rapid method. But it is something that's alternative to say what might be in Annex 1 or in a pharmacopoeia. Um, something that is designed to replace the uh, compendium method. And in most cases it makes sense to go for something that's more sensitive and faster. So that's where the rapid methods um, come in. 
So an example of a rapid method that can help support the environmental monitoring um, program are spectrophotometric um, counters. So these use advances in light scattering, optics and special software to provide real-time data about particles and biological activity in the air. So to a degree it's like a conventional particle counter. So air is drawn in and passed through a laser. And these instruments count the number of particles in a sample of air. But different to a standard particle counter, they will ascertain the uh, proportion of particles that are inert and the proportion of particles considered to be biologic. And this is achieved through different detectors. And the biologic particles are detected using a fluorescence detector looking for um, generally three biological uh, markers and these are metabolites NADH, riboflavin and uh, DPA which is an acid that's found in the coat of uh, spore forming um, microorganisms. So how, about, how might this kind of technology support a environmental monitoring program? Well let's look at some data um, from these types of systems. Um, so this is um, some data that um, I, I generated and um, with these charts uh, biological readings or bio readings are in red. Uh, particle counts are in um, yellow. So here we've got um, clean room in different states in relation to different activities in a facility. So we've got normal operating conditions before a shutdown, um, activity during a shutdown, um, bringing clean rooms fully back online but still undergoing cleaning and disinfection and the disruption that causes and the time required for that to settle down and then the clean room back in use um, post reinstatement. So this type of information can help us understand what is normal in terms of biological activity, it can help us understand the impact of people in an area, equipment movements and so on, it can help us understand what happens when an area is declassified, it helps us understand the impact of cleaning and it helps us understand that okay if a room has been cleaned how long does it take to recover before it could be potentially considered to be used for a GMP activity. And you can also apply this technology into interfaces around airlocks, what's going on, or in changing rooms and things like that to help establish um, what's the maximum number of people that are permitted in a changing room. Or if a changing room has been used, then what's the um, recovery time? Um, how long should you wait before the next person or group of people go into a particular changing room. Now any of these uh, methods need to be appropriately validated and it's good practice and to look back to our contamination control strategy principles for a risk assessment to be conducted before even contemplating any kind of change so you can think it through and then feed that into change control. Um, it's important to have design qualification because this is some documented evidence that our rapid method is fit for its intended purpose. Installation qualification, which is documented evidence that the instrument has been delivered and installed according to specifications. Operational qualification, which is evidence that the instrumentation operates within defined limits. And performance qualification, which is once the equipment has been installed, that it's operating correctly and it's given us a consistent series of um, outcomes. And there's going to be some more specifics with uh, methods that are designed to provide a quantitative value. So we need to have some understanding of accuracy. So we need to 
know what's going on at the upper end of an expected range and then work our way downwards. We need to have some idea of precision, so we need to understand the uh, source of variation between multiple samples and maybe use something like uh, standard deviation. We probably need a test of specificity, uh, particularly going back to those particle counters I spoke about because um, they might be affected by clothing fibres or something else that can fluoresce, which might give a false reading as a, as a biological event. We should understand the limit of quantification. We should have a degree of the method linearity. So, so this is a test to demonstrate um, how, whether there's a directly proportional relationship between uh, microorganisms used and those expressed by the rapid method. To have an understanding of the range, the upper and uh, lower limits, and of the robustness, so um, under different test conditions using different analysts, perhaps using different reagents and so on. So where there's a lot of subjecting the method to um, different levels of uh, rigour. Because all this is important to make a case for the change, to adopt a new method. So general validation steps will include things like the risk assessment, which I mentioned, Put in the, the URS DQ, um, IQ, OQ, PQ, uh, maybe a factory acceptance test, all under a validation master plan. To feed the validation master plan back to a user requirement specification as well, which is important. Are we getting what we asked for? Um, and, he, and when a validation has been executed and done at the represented number of times, then it should be evaluated and through a validation summary report. And although regulators are very receptive to um, rapid methods, um, there are still some uh, paths to cross. Um, and we need to make sure that we cover everything that would satisfy regulators to why we're going down a different path. We also need time to validate, we need a robust change process, need to make sure we can get um, good sample throughput, justify the cost, decide what we want to get out of it, is it time, is it greater accuracy, is it some kind of combination of the two, um, training and so on. Okay, so in the short time uh, available, what I've attempted to do is to introduce some of the uh, contamination control strategy concepts to um, look at one aspect of that which is environmental monitoring which is well established but there's different um, nuances and risk-based aspects which are really important talk a little bit about rapid method show the application of one rap rapid method and then loop back around with some of the validation requirements around rapid methods so um hopefully that's given some uh food for thought some things to think about so thank you for your attention thank you for watching uh, this presentation i've been uh, tim sandal and uh, thank you very much <laughs>